one. Part one. You'll hear a telephone conversation. Now you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh hi, I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs forty-five dollars per night. It provides air conditioning and shower, and a waterfront room costs eighty dollars per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged twelve and below, the cost is ten dollars per night for the guest house room and fifteen dollars for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court, or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges eight dollars each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs four dollars per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions seven to ten. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. Great. Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A L B U R Y, at six hundred and forty-eight Dean Street, New South Wales. Six four eight Dean Street, D E A N. Is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know. Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much. But it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some information about trips to New Zealand.、Uh, certainly. Take a seat, and I'll be right with you. Thanks. Now, where would you like to go in New Zealand? Well, I was hoping to do a bit of travelling around. Actually, there are a few things I'd like to see and do before I go back home. Right. One thing I really want to do is go to Christchurch. I have relatives living there that I can stay with, my mother's cousin, and I've heard it's a nice place. Yes, it's a lovely city, and staying with relatives will help with the budget, of course. The budget. 
It will save you some money. Oh, right. Well, I'm not too worried about that. I've saved quite a bit of money working in Australia. Oh, that's nice. Good for you. Uh, well, you know that New Zealand consists of two main islands, the North Island and the South Island, and Christchurch is on the South Island. Is it? I was never very good at geography at school. <laughs> Do you have a map I could look at? Uh, sure. Uh, here we are. Right, I see. And, well, then I'd also like to spend some time in Auckland and maybe I could do an English language course there. Can you organise that sort of thing for me? Oh, certainly. We'd be happy to arrange that. Uh, but bear in mind that Auckland is in the North Island. OK. And I'd also like to do some skiing or maybe even some snowboarding. I hear New Zealand is a great place for that. Yes, absolutely. But uh, you should go to Auckland first for your studies and then you can get the ferry across to the South Island and take the bus down to the snow. Oh, I don't like boats very much. <laughs> I'm not much of a sailor. I think I'd prefer to fly. <laughs> right. Um, what about joining a walking tour? That could be really fun. Not sure about walking, but... Joining a tour might be a good way to travel because then I might make some friends my own age. Now, let's get some details. Uh, can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Su Ming Li, but you can call me Sue. <laughs> OK, Sue. And what's your address here in Melbourne? I'm living with my aunt in the suburb of Kew. It's 29 Lock Street. That's... L-O-C-H, not L-O-C-K. Do you have a phone number that I can get you on? The best thing would be if I give you my mobile. I always have it on me. It's 0402 558 992. OK. And uh, when do you want to travel? Because you'll need to be down south in July or August. Oh, yes, of course. That's winter, isn't it? So i better go to Auckland in May. Yes. Let's say um, departing from Melbourne on the 1st of May. That's a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then you could begin your course on Monday the 3rd. That sounds great. And how long would you like to study for? Um, a month? Two? Three? What do you think? Well, I'll probably need more than a month. Uh what about eight weeks until the end of June? Fine. I'll see what I can do. Oh, and uh, how would you like to pay for this? On my visa card, if that's possible. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Hello Sue, it's Angelo from Cosmos Travel here. I've booked your flight and I've found you an English college called the Harbour Language Centre. Great. Where exactly is that? Uh, well, have you got that little map I gave you yesterday? Uh, yes. You see where the harbour is with the three wharves and the water? Yes, got that. OK, there are two parallel streets, Key Street... That's Q-U-A-Y and Custom Street. The building where the college is located is on Key Street, opposite Prince's Wharf. Right. Got it. And what about accommodation? Well, I've booked you into a hotel for the first three nights and then the accommodation officer will find you a family to live with. Good. And where's the hotel? It's a short walk from the college, on the corner of Queen Street and City Road. Which corner, exactly? On the left-hand side, as we're looking at the map. OK. Near the little park? Yes, that's right. And what about a good bookshop? I'm going to need to buy a dictionary and some English books. 
Yes, well, I believe there's a really good language bookshop on the corner of Customs Street and Queen Street. It's near the college, so that's pretty convenient. Thank you so much. You've been really helpful. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Dave, and his tutor about a project that Dave has done about work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Good afternoon, Dave. Come on in and take a seat. Hi, Doctor Green. Thanks. Oh, hang on a minute. I'll just find the first draft of your project paper, and we can have a look at it together. Now, yours is the one on work placement, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, what made you choose that for your project? Well, I suppose it was because sending students off to various companies for work experience seems to be such a typical part of educational courses these days. I mean, even school kids get to do it. But I felt everyone just kind of assumes it's a good thing, and I guess I wanted to find out if that's the case. But you don't look at schools or colleges, right? You've stuck to university placement schemes. Yeah, well, I quickly found that I had to limit my research, otherwise the area was just too big. Do you think that was okay? I think it's very sensible, especially as the objectives might be very different. So, how many schemes did you look at? Well, I sent out about 150 questionnaires altogether. You know, 50 of each to university authorities, students, and companies, and I got responses from 15 educational institutions, and、uh, 30 students in 11 individual companies. Great, that sounds like a good sample. And who did you send your company questionnaires to? Well, the idea was to have them done by the students' line managers, but sometimes they were filled in by the human resources manager, or even the owner of the company. Right, I didn't find a full list anywhere, so I think it's very important to provide that. Really, you can put it as an appendix at the back. Right, I've got a record of all the respondents, so that'll be easy. I hope other things were okay. I mean, I've already put such a lot of work into this project, identifying the companies and so on. Oh, I can tell. I think you've done a good job overall. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. I thought your questionnaires were excellent, and you'd obviously done lots of background reading, but there were a few problems with the introduction. First of all, I think you need to make some slight changes to the organisation of your information there. At present, it's a bit confused. Okay, what did you have in mind? Well, you write quite a bit about work placement in general, but you never explain what you mean by the term. So you think I should give a definition? Exactly, and the introduction is the place to do it. And then, look, you start talking about what's been written on the topic, but it's all a bit mixed up with your own project. So, do you think it would be better to have two sections there? Like a survey of the literature is the introduction, and then a separate section on the aims of my research. I do. You can include your methods for collecting data in the second section too. It would be much clearer for your reader. You know, establish the background first, then how your work relates to it. It would flow quite nicely then. Yes, I see what you mean. Anyway, moving on. I like the way you've grouped your findings into three main topic areas. Well, it became very obvious from the questionnaires that the preparation stage was really important for the whole scheme to work. So I had to look at that first, and I found a huge variation between the different institutions, as you saw. I was wondering if you could give a summary at the end of this stage of what you consider to be the best practice you found. I think that would be very helpful. Right. I'll just make a note of that. What did you think of my second set of findings on key skills development? For me, this is the core of my whole project, really. 
and you've handled it very well. I wouldn't want you to make any changes. You've already got a nice final focus on good practice there. Thanks. Right. Now, I think the last part, which deals with the reasons why students don't learn... What, the constraints on learning chapter? Yes, that's the one. I think you need to refer to the evidence from your research a bit more closely here. You know, maybe you could illustrate it with quotations from the questionnaires, or even use any extracts from a student diary if you can, and refer back to what you've written about good practice. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a talk about student health and specifically about ways to avoid headaches. Listen to what the speaker says and complete the summary. First, look at questions 30 to 40. As you listen to the talk, answer questions 30 to 40. Complete the summary. Hello, welcome to the Student Orientation Program. Today's session is on health issues and this talk is about headaches and how to avoid them. It may surprise you to hear the headaches are often caused by hunger. In fact, one study suggested that 70% of headaches are related to hunger, which makes it the principal cause. The advice is simple. Eat three meals a day and try to keep to a fairly regular schedule of meals. People associate noise with headaches, and for most of us, excessive noise creates the conditions for a headache. Very loud noise is unpleasant, and people usually remove themselves from it. Having said that, younger people tend to tolerate noise better than their elders, so I may be leaving noisy places far earlier than you. Just remember that exposure to too much noise may predispose you to a headache. Of course, we all associate headaches with studying. In fact, the headache probably doesn't come from the studying so much as from being tense. When we study hard, we often hunch over our work. Try raising your shoulders and tensing them, and now relax. Can you feel how much more comfortable a relaxed stance is? Another thing, it's very important to check that you're working in a good light. It will not actually hurt your eyes to work in a bad light, but it will make you tired very quickly, and is very likely to give you a headache. What's more, if you have the book flat on a desk in front of you, it'll be harder to read, and you'll have to hold your head at an odd angle. It is wise to have a book rest, which raises the material you are reading 45 degrees to the desk. This will help reduce your chance of a headache. Try to relax before bed, so that you'll be relaxed when you try to sleep. A soak in a hot bath may be helpful. It's also important to really sleep when you go to bed. A good mattress is a wise investment for people who want to avoid headaches. This talk seems to keep coming back to tension. Tension may cause you to chew too forcefully, clench your jaw or grind your teeth, and this in turn may lead to headaches. It is very easy to say that you shouldn't grind your teeth and very hard to stop particularly if you grind your teeth in your sleep. Try to avoid situations which will make you tense, particularly just before bed. If you do compulsively grind your teeth in your sleep, ask your dentist about a soft mouth guard. In general, try to eat regular meals and avoid tense situations. Be sure you get plenty of exercise. Hopefully your headaches will be greatly reduced. One other thing I should point out, avoid smoky rooms and cars. Such places certainly encourage headaches and the smoke may be doing you quite serious long-term damage. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs>